Well, once again, good afternoon, um, Hillcrest family and friends. We are in week three of a series I like to call in the third chapter of, and then we fill in the blank with the particular book that I'm using for the particular week. Uh, we started off with the book of Ezra in the Old Testament, then we moved to a New Testament lesson from Ephesians. And now we're back in the Old Testament to one of my favorite Old Testament books, the book of Ruth. And rather than jump right into the third chapter, uh, I think most people may know the story, but I'm going to briefly summarize the first couple of chapters for the placement of this part of the story that occurs in chapter 3. At a point in uh, Israel's history, there was a famine in Bethlehem. And as a result of that, one family, the family of Naomi, her husband Elimelech, and their two sons left, and they went to Moab because they had heard there was food in Moab. Now, Moab was one of those areas, places that the Israelite people were not to have any communion with, any connection with. So, in a way, th this family was going against a directive of God even though they were still faithful to God. <clears throat> While in the area of Moab, the two sons married Moabite women. And then the husband of Naomi dies and the two sons die. So Naomi is now left a widow. Not only that, but she has two daughters-in-law, one by the name of Orpha and the other one named Ruth. She then hears that the famine has ceased in Bethlehem, that there's bread there, and it's near the beginning of the barley harvest. So she determines that she, as a widow, needs to go home. And so Naomi tries to convince the two daughters-in-law to remain behind. One, Orpha, does remain behind, but Ruth refuses to leave Naomi. And we have that beautiful verse where Ruth says of Naomi, your people will be my people and your God my God. I will never leave nor forsake you. And so... Ruth returns with Naomi. They settle in Bethlehem. Ruth goes out and gleans in the barley fields. And this is where she first meets the owner of this field, Boaz, who we see in chapter 2 um, has an attraction to Ruth. He has a family connection to Naomi and he is thankful for Ruth's care and support of Naomi. And so you get a sense of him wanting to do things for his family that will help them now that they are both widows. And this brings us to the third chapter of Ruth, where Naomi instructs Ruth in the laws of the Leverite marriage, when she learns that Boaz is the owner of the field that Ruth gleaned in, she realizes that here is an opportunity for her to ensure Ruth and, by extension, her own security, should there be able to be a marriage between Ruth and Boaz. And so, Naomi explains about the laws of the Leverite marriage, the idea of the kinsman redeemer, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. 
I'm going to share a few verses from Ruth chapter 3. This is at the point where Ruth seeks out Boaz at the um, threshing shed in the evening uh, to invoke certain rights that she has as a widow and obligations that he has as a near kinsman. I'm reading from Ruth chapter 3, verse 7 through to 14a. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she, Ruth, came softly and uncovered his feet and laid herself down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. Okay, so in those beginning verses, we see uh, Boaz is settling down for the night, He's uh, enjoyed himself, he's eaten, he's had some wine, and he's just very relaxed and falls asleep. And Ruth slips in, uncovers his feet, and lies down. Now, <clears throat> we read this, some might think this was a provocative gesture, as if Ruth was told to provocatively offer herself sexually to Boaz. But this is not how this gesture was understood in that day. In the culture of that day, this was understood as an act of total submission. In that day, this was understood to be the role of a servant, to be at their master's feet and be ready for any command of the master. So when Naomi told Ruth to lie down at Boaz's feet, she told her to come to him in a totally humble, submissive way. Ruth came to claim a right. Boaz was her kinsman redeemer, and she had the right to expect him to marry her and raise up a family to perpetuate the name of Elimelech. Elimelech uh, be, having been her father-in-law. And under normal courses of things, the property upon Elimelech's death would have gone to his sons. Since the son that was married to Ruth has died, uh, another either brother or other near kinsman would step into the place of raising up uh, a family through Ruth that would inherit the lands. Naomi had wisely counseled Ruth to come not demanding her rights, but as a humble servant, trusting in the goodness of her kinsman redeemer. She said to Boaz, I respect you, I trust you, and I put my fate in your hands. You see, Naomi and Ruth had both had a chance to get to know Boaz, and they knew what kind of man he was a good man, a godly man, 
one to whom Ruth could confidently submit. So when Boaz discovers Ruth at his feet and when she makes her purpose known, he responds in verse 10, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followed not young men, whether poor or rich. In this verse, verse 10, Boaz suggested that other options were open to Ruth who might have chosen to marry for love or for money. But instead, she chose a marriage that would benefit her family setting, her family. She was setting her own desires aside. This was the greater kindness to Naomi than the other wonderful things she had done for her mother-in-law. Boaz recognized the attractiveness of Ruth and that she might have sought marriage among the personable young men of Bethlehem. However, Ruth had chosen to do the thing that would preserve the family into which she came when she married the son of Elimelech. The unselfishness of that choice is emphasized by the fact that Boaz, as tradition suggests, was a much older man than Ruth. And he says, I am a near kinsman. Well, kinsman, kinsman, redeemer, you know, there. if you want to really pick apart this story, there are many things about the narrative that don't fit the biblical teaching with regard to Leverite marriages that are outlined in Deuteronomy 20, 25. Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10 says nothing about a near kinsman. What it emphasizes is that it is the deceased husband's brother who is to marry the bereaved widow. Variations may be developed in different communities and circumstances to this law, but the important point was that as stated before, Ruth acted unselfishly by placing the purpose of providing an heir to her husband Malon and her mother-in-law Naomi on the highest level of priority, seeing her own happiness as secondary to that. Boaz is perfectly prepared to marry Ruth, but he also desires that the law be properly fulfilled. There is someone who has a prior right to fulfill the task of kinsman redeemer, and that person needs, needed to be presented with the opportunity to fulfill the requirement before Boaz uh, steps in that place. Well, it remains to draw some application for us from this special love story. In chapter 4, we're going to find that Boaz confronts the nearer kinsman redeemer, who turns out to be someone who is perfectly prepared to marry Ruth when he sees that he's going to acquire more land. But when he realizes the full extent of marriage to Ruth, a Moabitess, and the potential marring of his own inheritance, he's not prepared to give up everything to fulfill the requirement. And so Boaz uh, is now clear to marry Ruth in the law being fulfilled. There are important reasons that the story of Boaz and Ruth are here. First of all, Boaz and Ruth are part of the plan of salvation. Boaz and Ruth marry, and they have a child. And if we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we will find Boaz and Ruth 
mentioned in the genealogy because that child of Ruth is an ancestor of the line of Christ. The other important application is that Boaz acts as what I'll call a silhouette of Jesus in his role as kinsman redeemer to Ruth. There were four things that a kinsman redeemer had to possess under the law. He must be a kinsman. There must be a relationship between him and the family that he marries into to preserve the line. He must be free himself. He must be able to redeem and he must be willing to redeem. So if Boaz is a silhouette of Jesus, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And in what ways does he fulfill that role? Well, he must be a kinsman. Jesus, being fully human, while also being fully God, was kinsman to all mankind. And mankind, to receive salvation, must seek out that kinsman redeemer. He must be free himself. Jesus redeems us from the penalty of sin because he was free from sin himself. He must be able to redeem. Well, only God could redeem all mankind. But Jesus was both fully God and fully human being God, so he had the ability to redeem us. And equally important, a kinsman redeemer must be willing to redeem. Jesus made himself our sacrifice willingly, going to the cross, dying on the cross for our sins. One of the reasons I think I enjoy reading so much out of the Old Testament is the reality is that the Old Testament foreshadows, brings us forward into the New Testament. And so it is with the story of Ruth. It's a beautiful love story embedded in the body of the Old Testament, but it pictures so many things of what Christ has done for us, what God has done for us to bring us back into relationship with him, to be a part of the family of God, with him as our kinsman redeemer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you saved us. You saved us from the penalty of sin. You brought a method, a means of us by seeking you to bring ourselves into your presence, into your family, and to be ever one with one in communion with you. May we operate in love, in sharing, in all things as we live each day with you as our Savior and our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.